Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb on this your holy Shabbat. What an awesome thing it is to be able to come together as your people Israel. Natural branches and grafted in, but one in Messiah Yeshua. Just open the eyes of our understanding and enlighten us to the hope of your callings as we study your Torah today. And we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. B'shem Yeshua Mishiachenu, in the name of Yeshua our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, Ha'azinu is the name of our Torah portion. It means give ear. And it is from Devarim, or Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 52, the whole chapter. And it is the song of Moses that is not the good song of Moses. It's the bad song of Moses. It basically predicts the sin of Israel, that they're going to follow false gods and what's going to happen to them and everything else. But right in the middle of it, there's a neat blurb that I want to kind of focus on that um, describes how Yahweh won't ever give up on his people. In verse 8 of chapter 32, it says, When the Most High gave the nations each their heritage, when he partitioned out the human race, he assigned the boundaries of nations according to the number of the children of Israel. But Yahweh's portion was his people. Jacob, or Yaakov, was to be the measure of his inheritance. So even though this whole rest of the chapter is about how unfaithful they are and everything else, his inheritance is Jacob. And he's going to make sure that he brings Jacob back. Like Paul said in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved when it's time. Now Israel is Yahweh's inheritance. That's the thing I want to focus on. We're going to see as we study that not only is Israel his only inheritance, Israel is his betrothed wife. In Revelation, uh, we're called the Lamb's wife. And the Lamb's wife or the bride of Messiah, the bride of Christ as the church calls it, it's a subject that is not really understood by most today because all of the Christianity believes that they're going to be part of the bride. Well, when Yeshua actually gave us the parable about the wedding feast and, and the bride and everything, there were wedding guests as well as a bride. So, and then the one wedding guest that didn't have wedding garments on, he was cast in outer darkness. So we're going to look a little bit closer about who the bride is, what it takes to be part of the bride, and who the wedding guests are. So to be part of the Lamb's wife, it's available to all believers in Yeshua, but it will not include all believers in Yeshua. In Matthew 22, 2, we're told the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My ox, my fatling cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murders, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all who they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So just because you're at the wedding feast, we studied about the virgins last time, some of them didn't even make it in, but not everybody that makes it in is going to be allowed to stay. And we're going to look at why that is. So the kingdom of heaven will be comprised of wedding guests and a bride for Yeshua. Not all believers will be part of the bride. Most will actually be wedding guests. Not all believers will be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. Some will be cast out into outer darkness with the unbelievers. So just being born again, just being a virgin as we studied last week, that's not enough to get you there. You've got to be on time. You've got to be ready when he comes back. But you also have, as we've seen, you've got to have wedding garments on. 
that are acceptable to the master. So most understanding of the bride of Christ is based on the faulty understanding of a church separate from Israel. That's pretty much where Christianity is at because church is in all the English Bibles, but it's a mistranslation. We're not getting really into it here, but ekklesia is the Greek word that uh, kahal in the Hebrew that is translated as church, but church is neither a translation nor a transliteration. A transliteration is taking a word from like Greek and rather than translating it because you don't necessarily like the definition, you make a new English word like baptism. Baptisma was the word in the Greek and it means to totally immerse and the picture is like a sunken ship that's completely saturated inside and out. Well, they weren't saturating at the time, they were sprinkling and so they didn't want to translate that word so they made up a new word in English called baptism based just on the phonetic sounds of baptisma from the Greek. That's called a transliteration. A translation would have been to translate that word as fully immerse. Well, sometimes words are translated, sometimes they're transliterated. Another one is like deacon, diakonos is the Greek word, and it means servant. But that was a lofty office in the church at the time, so they didn't want to translate it as servant. They just made a new word in English called deacon. Well, ekklesia is the word in the Greek, or like I said, kahal in the Hebrew, and church is neither a translation nor a transliteration. Ekklesia means assembly, and in context, it's the assembly of God, and that's where that denomination actually got their name from, is they just translated the word ekklesia. So church has been snatched out of thin air, basically. If you study the etymology of it, it actually has to do with the building, but originally it was a place of pagan worship actually. Circe, that false goddess, actually comes from the same root that church was taken from. And uh, so it's not a good word really. And it definitely does not fully describe the body of Messiah. It is a word that was in, designed by the enemy to, to try to cause a division, make it look like, it's basically the, the foundation for replacement theology. Christianity literally is replacement theology. Whether they intended it or not, they believe that they're the church and those are the Jews and all that other stuff in the Old Testament was for them and we're now here as the bride of Christ and all this other stuff based on this faulty understanding of this separate group called a church. And there's really not. Uh, as we've studied, there is the commonwealth of Israel that Paul calls it in Acts or in Ephesians chapter 2 and that you were Gentiles, past tense he puts it, and now all have become part of the commonwealth of Israel. And in Romans 11, he, he shows it as a good olive tree made up of natural branches, but then some of the branches were broken off because of rejecting the Messiah. The Jews of today that reject Yeshua would be the natural branches, and then wild olive branches were grafted in, which would be, quote, the Gentiles, who become part of the same olive tree. The tree didn't change its identity, didn't become a new thing, a church where it wasn't before. It's the same tree that it was all the way back to Mount Sinai. It's the commonwealth of Israel. And so this concept of the church has just caused all kinds of problems in understanding scripture and how it actually applies to us. Now, in Acts chapter 7, verse 37, we see in the King James how this word is actually describing the proper concept. In Acts 7.37 it says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the living oracles or the lively oracles to give unto us. So this angel that was with him is actually Yeshua. He's the one that gave us the Torah. So if somebody says we're going to follow the commandments of Christ, well, it goes all the way back to Mount Sinai because he's the one that passed it on to Moses. Moses didn't come up with it himself. It was this angel of Yahweh, and it wasn't an ordinary angel. It was the angel of Yahweh who was Yeshua. We've got a study on that, too, if you're interested. But anyway, the church in the wilderness obviously was Israel. It was the congregation of, of God, mm -hmm. the assembly of God, basically. And so the church has always been Israel. It didn't become something different. It has always been Israel. So it was established at Mount Sinai when God gave us his living oracles, his Torah, through Moses, from this angel who was actually Yeshua. So the whole Torah is the commandments of Christ, if you want to get technical. There's a lot of uh, ministries that split hairs on that, and they want to try to just say the Sermon on the Mount is what we follow now. Those were the commandments of Christ. Well, it was the Sermon on the Mount that started at Mount Sinai that actually is the truth. So it was on the Mount. I was on both mounts. Yeshua explained it on the mount when he was there at 
that particular amount from Matthew 5 through 7. So the covenant that God established with us, as described in Exodus 20 through uh, verse 1 through 24, 8, that marked the birth of the church. That's when we received the book of the covenant, and Moses sprinkled the people with the blood, and, and we read, it was about 100, 110 commands. That was kind of a summation of the, the Torah. We've got the greatest command, which is to love one another the way that Yeshua loves us, and we can do that now that we have his love shed abroad in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. Then you've got the two, that you love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Those are the two main categories that every other commandment in the Torah falls under. You've got the ten, that's kind of like the table of context. The ten commandments, half of them do have to do with loving Yahweh with all your heart, soul, and strength. Half of them, half of them have to do with loving your neighbor. And then they're like the ten main categories as well, or the, the sub-context. And then you've got the rest of the commandments that describe how to love in detail Yahweh with all your heart, soul, and strength. That's what the Moedim are all about and the Shabbat and all these other things. And that's what the animal sacrifices were about. It was about loving our Father. And then the rest of it is about loving our neighbors, ourselves. Now, we weren't all physical descendants of Abraham when the church was born at Mount Sinai. There was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with the Israelites. So it's not about blood necessarily, it's about covenant. In uh, Exodus 12, 37, we see this. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. About 600,000 on foot were men, besides children and obviously their wives. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds and even very much cattle. So though we weren't all physical children of Israel, we all became part of the commonwealth of Israel, the church in the wilderness. And the new covenant would not change this. In Hebrews 8, Starting at verse 8, it says, For finding fault with him, he says, Behold, the day comes, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the covenant of Egypt, or the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. So what covenant was this he's talking about? It wasn't the whole Torah, because we saw at the end of Deuteronomy, there, this is another covenant beside the one made at Horeb. It's talking about the book of the covenant, that first book where we agreed, yeah, we'll do this. That's the covenant that was broken. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. I mean, they broke it almost immediately. One of those commandments was, you will not have any other gods before me. You will not make a graven image. Well, they immediately made the golden calf. So that's how they broke the covenant. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now notice he's not making any covenants with any Gentiles because there are no covenants with Gentiles. That's why the Gentiles is in the past tense in Ephesians because you can't stay a Gentile and be in covenant with Yahweh. A Gentile is a nation besides the commonwealth of Israel. And I regard in the not, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, that I will put my laws, is what it says here, but if we go back to where it was quoted from, it's Torah, into their mind, write it in their hearts, I will be a God to them, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So we know that that's not true yet. So obviously the new covenant isn't even fully unfolded yet. It started when Yeshua said, this is the blood of the new covenant back at the last Passover. But not everybody's going to know Yahweh even during the thousand year reign because Satan's going to be released at the end and he's going to go and corrupt the nations and they're going to gather the sand of the seashore at Jerusalem. And then fire rains down from heaven to destroy them. So not everybody knows Yahweh until the new heavens and the new earth. So that's when the new covenant is really in full effect. And we all have our glorified bodies. That's the ultimate end of it, the adoption, the redemption of our bodies, it says in Romans 8. So the writers of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah 31, starting at verse 31. Behold, the day comes, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And again, it concludes no Gentiles. You have to be a member of one of those two houses if you're going to be part of the new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. Notice, he's a husband to them. That was actually a betrothal at Mount Sinai. The marriage ceremony has not happened yet, but that was basically the ketubah. In the Jewish culture, when you're going to be betrothed to somebody, 
it's as good as being married. You actually give them a legal document and, and you sign it and this is a commitment that you're making, which is why Joseph couldn't just say, oh, I'm done with you, Mary, and leave because he was literally betrothed to her. So he had to, he was going to put her away. He literally would have had to get a divorce if he was going to do it. So we're betrothed to Yahweh, but we have not yet been through the marriage supper of the Lamb. There has not been a wedding ceremony yet. We are betrothed, though. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my Torah in their inward parts and write it in their, heart, or in their, yeah, write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now again, notice that the new covenant is established with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not with Gentiles. The Gentiles have to be born again. Actually, everybody has to be born again, but when you are, you become part of the commonwealth of Israel. So his covenant people did not change. It was just expanded. The house of Israel and the house of Judah is the church in the wilderness that was established at Mount Sinai with Moses. Now the writings of the new covenant, which Yahweh put in our inward parts, wrote in our hearts, is the Torah. It's his laws, his holy Torah, which he gave us at Mount Sinai. So the instructions didn't change, they just became internalized by the Holy Spirit. Paul explains how the Gentiles are converted and made part of the commonwealth of Israel here in Ephesians 2. We're going to go ahead and read it, starting at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So the good works that couldn't save us, that it explained in the previous two verses, are the good works he wants us to walk in once we're born again. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, and that word is plural because it's the covenants, all the covenants of Israel that were made nigh to, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Messiah Yeshua, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Messiah. Skipping to verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So now... The wild olive branches are fellow citizens with the good olive branches, which are the saints and the household of God. So the former Gentiles are no longer considered Gentiles, but are now part of the commonwealth of Israel and made fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, which is the church in the wilderness that was established at Mount Sinai. Now, as I said, covenants is plural. The former Gentiles are not just made partakers of the new covenant, but are made nigh by the blood of Messiah to all the covenants of Israel. So the former Gentiles now have an opportunity to embrace all the covenants of Israel if they so choose. The new covenant is all that's required to be born again and to have eternal life and to be with Yahweh forever. But there's a little more intimacy involved when we walk in all the covenants with him because it puts us at a different status as we're going to see. So Paul gives us another illustration of the fact that the former Gentiles are grafted into the original church in the wilderness in Romans 11. Starting in verse 7 he says, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Now, why did Yahweh do that? Because they chose to reject his Messiah. It's like Pharaoh hardening his heart. Yahweh says, okay, that's your choice, and I'll harden your heart too. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is the riches of the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. So this is the whole reason Paul's ministering the Gentiles is still to provoke his fellow Jews to jealousy. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you... Being a wild olive tree, we're grafted among them, 
and with them become a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. There goes eternal security out the window. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. It's a choice. You have to abide in him. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, you would be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So the good olive tree, which was the church in the wilderness, never changed and became a different tree. The elect natural branches were maintained in the good olive tree, while the blinded natural branches were broken off because of unbelief in their Messiah. The high priest of Israel, after the order of Melchizedek, Psalms 110.4 and Hebrews 7.14-27 explains that. Yeshua is the only way to the Father because he is the true high priest. When he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that's what he's referring to himself as. You can't go to the Father by yourself. That's the whole purpose of setting up the priesthood of Aaron was to demonstrate that no one can go into the Holy of Holies, just the high priest and just one time a year back then. So it was to show us that you've got to have a representative. You've got to have an advocate. The grafted in branches are Gentiles, which are made up of the scattered ten tribes and also a mixed multitude, just like the beginning. Most of the people being born again today probably have some bloodline from Israel, from being scattered years and years ago, thousands of years ago. But the Father knows exactly who each and every one of us are. So the majority of people coming to Yeshua are probably physical descendants, but not all because there was a mixed multitude. So nobody's excluded. But his promise was to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their seed would be remembered and would be gathered back in. Now there's those that teach that there's a higher standard of obedience that's required or a higher standard of holiness to be part of the bride of Messiah rather than just a wedding guest. But as we study scripture, we're going to see that that's not true. Being completely holy, set apart without spot or wrinkle, is what's required to be a wedding guest, part of the body of Messiah, the church in the wilderness. Matthew 5, 17, he says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the, th the Torah or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And as we talked before, destroying means to wrongly interpret, and fulfilling means to correctly interpret. It's a Jewish idiom or a Hebrew idiom. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So breaking just one of the least of the commandments in the Torah and teaching that it's acceptable will get you demoted to least in the kingdom like Peter's vision did away with not eating pork. That is a lie, and if you believe that and teach that, then you're going to be demoted to least in the kingdom. Now, the status of being least in the kingdom is a position that, of not being part of the bride, obviously. So we can see that keeping all of God's commandments contained in His Torah is part of what's required to be His bride. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you that you shall be no priest to me, seeing that you have forgotten the Torah of your God, I will also forget your children. So, I mean, this can actually affect your whole family, affecting your children as well. 
Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. It's always about our works, always about our obedience. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And they did. They're not lying. They're standing before the creator of the universe, going over why they think they should be allowed in. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, you who have abolished my Torah. So acting like the Torah has been abolished or nailed to the cross or however you want to explain it will get you cast out. Luke 12, 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household? Now notice he's talking about leadership. The leaders are going to be held at a much higher standard. To give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and drink and be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and at an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in sunder or in two, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. So this is a servant who is actually a leader in the body of Messiah. And he gets the same reward as the unbelievers because he wasn't faithful. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask more. So notice, beating of stripes is not done in heavenly places. There is no sorrow or anything there. This is levels of punishment basically in hell. Just because you're ignorant is not going to be an excuse. We've all got the book. We all need to get in and study it and ask him to show us the truth. So though this man was a servant, a believer, he was appointed his portion with the unbelievers because of his disobedience. The disobedient servant that knew better but deliberately disobeyed will be beaten with many stripes. Those that were ignorant but still did things that deserved a beating will be beaten with fewer stripes but will still be beaten. And the beatings do not take place in the kingdom of heaven. They illustrate eternal torment. Just as there's different levels of reward in the kingdom of heaven, there will be different levels of torment in the lake of fire. Luke 17, 5 says, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he's come in from the field, Come, sit at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk, and then afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did those things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We've done what our duty was to do. So just doing our duty is obviously not enough. Being a good servant requires more than just obedience to Torah. Obeying Torah should result in our loving God with all of our heart, soul, and strength and loving our neighbors as ourselves. We should be looking for ways to bless Yahweh by blessing one another. Like Matthew 25 illustrates, whatever we do to the least of these, our brethren, we've done it to Yeshua. So let's scripturally examine what is required to be a good servant, a good wedding guest. Luke 13, 23, Then one said to him, Lord, are there few that are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter in through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So just seeking is not going to be good enough. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you're from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. 
Now, I didn't look it up this time, but chances are that's that same word, anomia, the same excuse that he told the people in Matthew 7, depart from me, you who are lawless, because it's translated iniquity in the regular King James as well. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and from the west, from the north, from the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. So the word strive in Greek is interesting. It's agonizomai, and it means to enter a contest, contend in the gymnastic games, to contend with adversaries, to fight. It's a metaphor to contend, to struggle with difficulties or dangers, but it literally came from the classical Greek, uh, Greek describing the Olympic athletes' effort as they were contending in the games, as they were fighting the fight or racing in the race. They were putting forth everything they had. They weren't holding anything back. They were going for the gold, as we would say. So we're holding nothing back. We're given 100% total commitment in order to enter the kingdom of God. He is our life. It's not just part of our life. He is our life. We are his children. He is our God. So this is what's required just to be a good servant. To be part of his bride requires something in addition. In Ephesians 5.25 it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah also loved the assembly and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. blemish. So it's not just the bride that is to be without spot or wrinkle, it's the entire assembly, which is going to be mostly wedding guests. James 1.27, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, we're all supposed to be unspotted from the world. It's not just the bride. It's the wedding guests as well. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, putting away lying, let each, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has the need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Messiah forgave you. So these are the attributes that our Father wants for all of His children to have, not just the bride. 2 Corinthians 10.3 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of the Messiah, and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So bringing every thought into obedience from, to the Messiah is part of how we keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And it's for everybody, not just the bride. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all are members that do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Messiah and individually members of one another. So what we were teaching the other day. We are in covenant with one another. We all are in covenant with Yahweh, and so we're members of one another as well. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. 
He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Not lacking in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Heaping coals of fire on his head, that sounds kind of bad, doesn't it? Actually, they didn't have matches back in the time of when this was written. They all had fire because they all cooked with fire. They heated their house with fire. So if your fire went out, you'd have to go to your neighbor and borrow some coals to get your fire going again. And what they would do is put it in a basket on top of their head. So heaping coals of fire on their head was actually a blessing so that they could get their fire started again. So when he says, don't kindle a flame on Shabbat, and people says, well, that just means don't do the work that it takes to start a fire. Well, they never really started fires. They just went to their neighbors and borrowed it. So it wasn't any work to get your fire back going again other than just walking next door. So it's a little more meaning to it than what most people understand. Now, one of our obligations is to pre present our bodies as living sacrifices. We're not to live after the flesh. Romans 8, 5 through 8 makes that very clear. But we're to walk after the spirit. Now, we enable ourselves to do this by renewing our minds to the Torah. In Psalms 1, 2 through 4, and in Joshua 1, 8, it makes it clear that if we do that, we'll prosper in whatever we do. When we do this, we'll not be overcome by evil, but we will overcome evil with good. But there again, this is what's required of all believers, not just the bride. Matthew 25, 1, we just read this last week, says, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. But those who, took the foolish, or those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom's coming! Go out to meet him! Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and for you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. We've got to stay ready. These were all virgins, but they were not automatically part of the bride. I mean, everybody that's going to be there is likened into a virgin, basically. I mean, that's what it's talking about in the 144,000, that they're virgins. It means they're pure. They're not defiled with women. They're keeping themselves pure before Yahweh. doesn't mean that they've never actually had sexual intercourse, and that's not what it's talking about here either. But we're chaste. We keep ourselves pure for Yahweh, but just being a virgin is not enough. You have to continue to abide in him. You have to continue to watch for him. The wise had learned to strive to enter in by walking after the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. They'd renewed their minds to the Torah with the result of the fruit of love was being manifest, while the unwise had not. We can't wait until the Master returns to do these requirements. It'll be too late then. Matthew 25, 14 goes on. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants to deliver his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he had received the five talents, went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, those who had received 
uh, two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with him. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. The Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you uh, have not scattered seed. And behold, I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what's yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant! You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming I would have received my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, though this man was a servant, he hadn't kept the requirements of his master and as a result was cast into outer darkness. Now we know from this parable told in Luke, that this is the same reward that the unbelievers receive. This is the lake of fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on His throne of His glory. All nations will be gathered before Him and He will will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. He'll set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we're ultimately going to be judged by our obedience to the requirements of our master. We can't make up our own rules. We've got to follow his The requirements of striving to enter in by presenting our body as living sacrifices and renewing our minds to Abba's Torah result in his love being manifest in us, which is a demonstration. It's demonstrated by our love for one another. When we show our love to one another by taking care of one another's needs, we're actually showing our love for Messiah Yeshua himself. We've been taught that salvation is a free gift, that all we have to do is receive it. And it's free in the fact that you can't buy it, but actually, it costs you your life. It costs you everything. You're entering a covenant. You're giving yourself completely to your covenant partner, and he's given himself completely to us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and which you have of God, that you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's been bought with the most precious thing in all creation, the blood of Yeshua. Complete and total commitment is required to be part of the commonwealth of Israel, the church in the wilderness, not a higher standard to be part of his bride. There's a teaching that once you say the magical incantation and become a believer, that 
uh, Yeshua is now your Savior, and then later on He becomes your Lord, that's bunk. He's not your Savior unless He is your Lord, because that's what making Him Lord is all about. He can't be one without the other. If the bride of Messiah is not all the commonwealth of Israel, then who exactly is the Lamb's wife? When is the Lamb's wife revealed? Well, we see it in Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of, her, of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had great and high walls with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates. And names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. There's no Gentile gate. You're going to be part of one of those tribes, the commonwealth of Israel. If you didn't have any blood of one of those tribes to start with, then you'll go in through the gate of Judah because you're part of the body of the lion of the tribe of Judah. You will be considered a Jew. Now three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, its gates, its wall, the city's laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So it's either a big cube or it's a pyramid. Then he measured its walls, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. So it must have been a pretty big cubit. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was of pure gold like clear glass. Now, when the astronauts actually went into outer space, they had a thin layer of gold on their visors, and it screened out all the ultraviolet radiation and everything else. Pure gold is clear, and that's what it's talking about here. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third cal uh, chalcedony, or the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysophrase, the eleventh, jathanth, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved, now notice there's nations that are saved that aren't actually part of this city, shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So our first clue in understanding who the Lamb's wife is comes from seeing who it's not. The nations that are saved are not the Lamb's wife, but bring their glory and honor to it. Now we also see this illustrated in Isaiah chapter 60. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of Yahweh is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But Yahweh shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together. They come to thee, the sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see, and flow together, in your heart shall fear and your heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all from Sheba, shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall show forth the praises of Yahweh. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered unto, uh, together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with the acceptance of my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. So this is during the thousand-year reign when this is the temple he's talking about that Yeshua builds. 
Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? This is the super race, those with glorified bodies that get them when Yeshua returns, where everybody else is still mortal. Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of Yahweh your God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. And the sons of the strangers shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister unto you. For in my wrath I smote you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought in. Notice he's comparing his people again to a city, because that's his bride. That's the Lamb's wife. For the nations and the kingdoms that will not serve you shall perish. Yea, those nations shall utterly be wasted. But the ones that choose to be born again and follow Yeshua, make him their master, they're going to be those that the cities or the nations that are saved. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make your place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted you shall come bending unto you, and all they that despised you shall bow themselves down at your soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of Yahweh, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, and eventually the New Jerusalem. This is during the thousand-year reign, though, that he's comparing this to. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through you, I will make you an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. You shall also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shall suck the breast of kings. And you shall know that I, Yahweh, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. For brass, I will bring gold. And for iron, I will bring silver. And for wood, brass. And for stones, iron. I will also make your officers peace and your extractors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall be called... Uh, shall, shall call thy walls salvation. So the walls of Jerusalem are called salvation, and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more. Your light by day, neither for brightness shall be the moon give light unto you, but Yahweh shall be unto you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. So this is a precursor of the new heavens and the new earth. It's almost exactly like what we're going to see, but you've still got mortal people, and then you've got those with glorified bodies here. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall your moon withdraw itself, for Yahweh shall be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be ended. Your people shall also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. So there's going to be prolific childbirth during this time. I, Yahweh, will hasten it in its time. Chapter 61, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance. So this is the passage that Yeshua read back in Luke 4 and then he sat down mid-sentence and every eye was upon him. That's because he stopped mid-sentence. He only read the part that he was here to fulfill the first time at his first coming the rest of it describes what he's going to do when he comes back and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to point unto them that are mourning Zion to give them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness the planting of Yahweh that he might be glorified and they shall build the old waste they shall raise up the former desolations they shall repair the waste cities the desolations of many generations, and the strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priest of Yahweh. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double. For your confusion they shall have rejoiced in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, Yahweh, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings. I will direct their work in truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. 
and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which Yahweh has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. These are the garments that we've got to have as wedding guests. And has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So here we see that the saved children of Israel are identified with Zion, the city of Yahweh. The saved Gentiles come and minister to the children of Israel. Isaiah gives us more insight into the distinction between Israel and the saved nations in chapter 19, starting at verse 17. And this is the part that really kind of lines up with our Torah portion. This explains his inheritance. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Everyone that makes mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of Yahweh of hosts, which he has determined against it. And that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to Yahweh of hosts. One shall be called the city of destruction. And that day shall there be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to Yahweh. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto Yahweh of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto Yahweh because of the oppressors and he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them. And Yahweh shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall be known to Yahweh in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow to Yahweh and perform it. And Yahweh shall smite Egypt. He shall smite it and heal it. And they shall return even to Yahweh, and he will be entreated of them, and shall heal them. And that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, to whom Yahweh of hosts shall, uh, shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. So you've got the nations that are saved, and then you've got the Lamb's wife. You can stay an Egyptian if you so choose and be Yahweh's people. You can stay an Assyrian and be the work of his hand. Or you can choose to become part of physical Israel and actually be his inheritance. So we see that Israel is Yahweh's inheritance, but is she really the Lamb's wife? The answer to this question becomes apparent when we see who Yahweh married originally. And we saw that in Jeremiah, but we're going to look at Ezekiel now, 16, starting at verse 1. The word of Yahweh was addressed to me as follows. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her loathsome practices. Say, the Lord of hosts says this, By origin and birth, you belong to the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. At birth, the very day you were born, there was no one to cut your navel string or wash you in water to clean you or rub you with salt or wrap you in swaddling clothes. No one looked at you with pity enough to do anything or any of these things out of sympathy for you. You were exposed in the open fields and your own dirt on the day you were born. I saw you kicking on the ground in your blood as I was passing. And I said to you, you lay in your blood, live, and I will make you grow like the grass of the fields. You developed, you grew, you reached marriable, marriageable age. Your breasts became firm and your hair grew richly, but you were stark naked. Then I saw you as I was passing. Your time had come, the time for love. I spread my cloak over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my oath. I made a covenant with you, declares the Lord Yahweh, and you became mine. So when we, are, we were in our blood and developed into a nation when we were in Egypt as slaves, we became betrothed, became Yahweh's at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20 through 24 when we entered into covenant upon hearing the book of the covenant and being sprinkled with blood. In Jeremiah 3, 6, we get a little more insight. He says, Yahweh said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot, just as he predicted in our Torah portion. And I said, after she had done these things, Turn you unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous uh, sister Judah saw it. 
And I saw, and for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, because we had already had the ketubah in Mount Sinai. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass, through the lightness of her whoredom, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and stocks. She was going after false gods. And yet for all her treacherous, sister Judah had not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly said, Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return, you backsliding Israel, says Yahweh, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, says Yahweh, and I will not keep angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity and that you've transgressed against Yahweh your God and have scattered your ways to the strangers under every green tree, and you've not obeyed my voice, says Yahweh. Turn, O backsliding children, says Yahweh, for I am married to you. So even though he put her away, just like Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the earth, he knew he would be bringing her back. That's what the book of Hosea is all about. Even though Gomer deserved to be put away because of her adultery, Yahweh in his mercy went and bought her back. That's his heart. I am married to you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with the knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, says Yahweh, that they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of Yahweh, neither shall they come, it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall it be done anymore. So chances are, just like in Herod's temple, the future temple is not going to have the ark of the covenant either. It's not required. It was just a picture of what's in the throne room anyway. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of Yahweh, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. So though Yahweh divorced Israel, he did not give up on her. He drew her back. He bought her again. As I said, the book of Hosea, it illustrates this fact. Israel is who Yahweh declares that he's married to and always will be married to. Physical Israel, those who are circumcised in heart and in flesh is who the Lamb's wife is, which is identified with Jerusalem as Isaiah continues to reveal. Isaiah 62.1, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof is a lamp that burns. And the Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of Yahweh shall name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of Yahweh, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, neither shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah, for Yahweh delighted in you, and your land shall be married. So again, he's showing us that relationship of his bride. It includes the land, the new Jerusalem, and even the Jerusalem at the time that he's, this is written. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. You that make mention of Yahweh, keep not silence, and give him no rest till he establishes, till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And that's going to happen during the thousand year reign. In the tribulation period, he's going to bring all nations against Jerusalem because in Revelation it says that that holy city has become like Sodom and like Egypt because of the Jews that are over there today. Unfortunately, they've rejected the Messiah. They're the broken off branches. And he's going to, in his mercy, bring the nations against Jerusalem to try to bring them to repentance. Yahweh has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, Surely I will no more give your corn to be your meat for your enemies, and the sons of the strangers shall not drink your wine. For the which you have labored, but they that have gathered it shall eat it, and praise Yahweh, and they that have brought it together shall drink. Drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare you the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, 
Gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, Yahweh has proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye unto the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. And that's Yeshua in Hebrew. Your Yeshua comes. Behold, the reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh, and you shall be called the sought out a city not forsaken. His bride is Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is Israel. One and the same. The holy people, the physical children of Israel, are identified with the holy city, Jerusalem. Now, the nations that are saved, they are the Gentiles, bringing all the wealth and the strength to that holy city. So now that we know that the bride is physical Israel, what is actually required to become part of the bride? How can a person that is not a physical descendant of Abraham become part of physical Israel? How can a wild olive branch become a natural branch? Doesn't have to happen, but that option is there. Exodus 12, 43. And Yahweh said unto Moshe and Aharon, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought of money, when you have circumcised him, then he shall eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with you and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised. Again, why would they want to do that? Because they love Yahweh. They understand this is how we love the Father in a deep fashion that we know is what he desires. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is home-born, and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. Now in Exodus, in the New Revised Standard Version, we get a little bit better translation of this passage. Verse 48 says, If an alien who resides with you wants to celebrate the Passover to Yahweh, all his males shall be circumcised, then he may draw near to celebrate it. He shall be regarded as a native of the land. Physical Israel, after the physical circumcision takes place. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. So the former stranger is regarded as a native of the land when he is circumcised. Now, when his heart was circumcised, he became part of the commonwealth of Israel, but he was one of the nations that are saved at that point. But he can actually enter all the way in and become part of physical Israel through physical circumcision. A grafted-in branch can become as a natural branch if he chooses to be circumcised, physically circumcised. Really, I say that it, it literally takes embracing all the covenants of Israel to be part of physical Israel. Physical circumcision is part of it. The covenant given to us at Mount Sinai is part of it. The covenant that it talked about in Deuteronomy, the last verse of chapter 28, or the first verse of 29, depending on the version you have. The covenant made at Moab, this is another covenant. So all the covenants of Israel is what we're supposed to walk in, if we want that intimate relationship of being his bride. So a former Gentile can become not only part a, a spiritual part of Israel through circumcision of the heart, but also a physical part of Israel through circumcision of the flesh. Now notice what this will get you during the thousand year reign. Ezekiel 44, 9. Thus says the Lord God, No stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So if you want to go into where Yeshua is in the sanctuary during the time of his reign here, you will be circumcised in heart and circumcised in flesh. Doesn't mean you're not saved if you're not. It just means you can't go in there and be that intimate with them. You won't be able to get that close to them. You'll be saved for all eternity, but you won't have that intimacy that you could have. The choice is ours. How intimate do we want to be with our Creator? How intimate do we want to be in our worship? We can be saved wedding guests, or we can be His bride. The choice is ours to make. Let's pray. Father, we come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb, Yeshua, our Messiah. What an honor it is to be able to learn your ways to learn your teaching and instruction contained in your Torah. Thank you for drawing us in to that intimate place of worship with you, that intimate relationship that we can have. Thank you, Father, that we're not going to perish for a lack of knowledge, but you are blessing us with your knowledge and your wisdom even now. You've given us the mind of Messiah. Continue to open the eyes of our understanding. Continue to enlighten us to the hope of your calling. Teach us your ways. We want to know you, Father. 
We love you. I thank you that you have made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, P'nave Lecha, V'hunecha. Yesa Yahweh Panave Lecha Vayasim Lecha Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. Hallelujah.